I am running and the publisher of the largest Haredi uh, media group, Mishpacha. Um, in Hebrew and in English, today it's an international publication who uh, gears to the ultra-Orthodox Haredi uh, community across the world. And Mishpacha mission over the years became uh, uh, to elevate the Haredi society and to address the current challenges of the Haredi society in a very sensitive, but at the same time in a very sincere way, uh, because we believe that a strong society uh, can be strong only with always being uh, challenged and, and, and challenging themselves. So over the years, Mishpacha, and this was my main mission, became the voice of the Haredi society addressing issues, social issues like um, um, discrimination in some communities, uh, um, violence, kids at risk, and etc. And that's very naturally brought me to my philanthropic stage, which was six years ago, I started my, uh, uh, my fam family foundation with a sense of urgency that we needed to do something more strategically uh, uh, to try uh, facing the changes in the Haredi demographic in Israel. Just to give you some figures, you will see later some more figures, but just one of the figures that we are uh, uh, sharing recently is that in this school year, uh, every fourth child in this Jewish school in Israel is a Haredi child. You don't have to be very uh, smart to understand that this is really an earth shake in terms of the future of Israel. And we are acting with the sense that this is something that needs a strategic way, needs a co coalition of all the partners, government, community leaders, rabbinical leaders, and uh, for sure philanthropy to try to build together a long-term uh, futures. I think that the current situation of the corona emphasized even strongly our general mission by saying that there is no way we can, we don't have the luxury to try to ignore uh, the special uh, uniqueness and needs and culture of the Haredi society. Everybody understand, and I think this is one of my main lessons from the corona, that there is no way you can say, okay, we'll take care about the general needs and hopefully that will also work with the Haredi. I think everybody is aware, you will hear about it later, that this is something that uh, uh, didn't work and brought to some of the crises. And the meeting today is really to try together, to try to address the issues and to work together on building some of the uh, uh, recommendations about the future. Um, I'm, I want to thank again Sharon and Reut, our partners in Jeff and Israel, of making it happen. I'm, I was very impressed working with you. I want to thank my uh, staff of doing a very thorough uh, preparation for this meeting, and I'm wishing all of you a very successful and fruitful discussion. I am pleased now to pass the mic to Roiko and the CEO of the Haredi Institute for Public Affairs. Thank you, Eli. Um, in the next 10 minutes, Roi, CEO of the Haredi Institute for Public Affairs, will provide an overview of the unique characteristics of the Haredi society that led to the development of the COVID crisis in the Haredi society and will set forth possible areas of interventions and key recommendations. Roy, the Zoom is yours. Thank you very much, Roman. Hello to you all. Thank, Thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And big thanks to the JFN for hosting this uh, discussion. As you said earlier, over the next hour, we will try to paint a picture of the coronavirus crisis in the Haredi community and what can be done to ensure a more secure Israel for all. A little bit about uh, uh, the Haredi Institute. Uh, so the Haredi Institute for Public Affairs is the research institute which we are specializing in strategic planning and learn term and research-based policy proposal, of course, related to the Israeli Haredi population. And we conduct research for actionable strategies in a variety of areas. You can take it, for example, the health, housing, employment, and, and more. Before we dive into the episode of the coronavirus, let's consider the big story, the bigger story as Ellie mentioned earlier. That is Israel's demographic story. In a study we'll really soon, we, uh, uh, we demonstrate that if trends continue, I mean that if the Haredi maintain the predicted birth rate and don't integrate into the, vo into the workforce, sorry, Socioeconomic indicators in Israel will drop dramatically. 
I mean that Israel will fall behind drastically in quality of life, employment rates, tax revenue, you name it. So this is the bigger story. But again, the Corona crisis illustrates perfectly that we must understand the Haredi society characteristic, language and values, because these are the key. And let's focus on several crucial factors to consider. The first one is residential density. So let's examine the number of people per room. In general, it is doubled in the Haredi community. Let's take, for example, Modi'in elite, the number is two people per room. And for instance, in Herzliya, the number is 0 0.7. And if we look at, let's take, uh, I don't know, residents per square kilometers, we're talking about three or four times higher than equivalent non-Haredi areas. You can imagine what the implications are about the coronavirus. Next is communal lifestyle. Of course, this is the lifeblood of the sector, neighborhood shows, life cycle events, gathering, you name it. It's, it's really embedded in the day-to-day -day routine. Another one, another characteristic is the community's opposition to technology and internet. I mean that we are talking about limited access to information, this is, uh, on the one hand, and dramatic limitation in accessing online services. Let's examine learning and working remotely. Uh, online grocery orders, telemedicine, you name it, are non-existent in the Haredi community. So with no option for doing these things at home, people will go out and infect each other. Perhaps the most paramount uh, is the importance of learning Torah. And this is the value of the highest order for the Haredi sector. And the government directive to close yeshivas in school was seen as a massive desecration of God's name and something only to be done, let's say, as a last resort, as, as Torah learning is seen as a protective measure. So the Haredi public could not accept the comparison between Torah learning and other activities of the secular public. Let's take, for example, a school. And finally, uh, that's a, a characteristic that lasts with us uh, for a few decades. We're talking about lack of faith in the government. Um, traditionally, the authority was viewed uh, with skepticism, of course. Uh, only when rabbis began calling uh, the public to obey the health ministry directives did the community fall in line. So this is very important. Uh, in that point, I must say that a survey that was published yesterday shows a dramatic positive change and will, of course, follow up with this. To make matters worse, the government did not take any of these factors in, in, into account uh, when trying to get the message across the Haredi public. Fortunately, as Sharon said earlier, we have with us uh, Brigadier General and Reserve Ronen Manelis. He, was the, he, he is the former uh, IDF spokesperson. Uh, he was one of the head of the uh, Bnei Brak Task Force. He, he is here with us to give us a first-hand account and understanding of what happened in Bnei Brak. I want to give you a spoiler alert. A commando brigade was deployed in the city to help Mada carrying a Hebrew-Yiddish dictionary. So, Think about it. We understood, we understand uh, more about the way Haredim think and live. So now we have a, a quite good understanding. Let's trace the sequence of events. Let's understand a little bit more deeply uh, with some more clarity. So let's start on February 27th, it's the first case uh, of corona patients confirmed in Israel. The situation was handled with meticulous caution. Everything felt about under control. A little less than two weeks later, on 10th of March, Purim celebration began across the country. And I want to tell you that at this point, significant restrictions have not yet been imposed, but only large gathering and mass celebration have been canceled. I must confess something, I'm completely <laughs> secular, I, I, but, but I think you already noticed it. Noticed it. Um, until a few weeks ago, and this is amazing. I had no clue and no idea what Purim celebration meant in the Haredi community. Turns out that for Haredim, fulfilling the tradition of the day includes contact with potentially hundreds of families. We're talking about uh, um, synagogue gathering, home gathering, food gathering, uh, um, you name it, charity, 
uh, disenchanted those who came knocking, potentially hundreds of, of, of uh, people that got together. So that, that's fine. Roy Cohen didn't know about that. that. That's a big deal. That's not a big deal, sorry. But the decision makers also knew nothing about it. And that's the issue. And in retrospect, experts say that a large number of infected people in the Haredi sector was the result of the Purim festivities. So as you understand, the, the key here is awareness of the sector's different customs and characteristics, and, and we'll return to this later. Unfortunately, Purim wasn't the only event that contributed to, to the spike in infection. Purim was over March 12th, the restriction went up a notch. Uh, I want to remind you, we're talking about a uh, gathering uh, over about, I think, 10 people were banned. Uh, they asked people to maintain a distance of two meters from each uh, one another in the public. And at this stage, and this is something that is very crucial, life in the Haredi sector continued basically as usual. Schools remained open, shuls and mikvehs were packed, wedding, everything you want to imagine, basically, continued as usual. So gradually, sense of an emergency began to take hold in Haredi concentration, but it was too late. By the end of March, the outbreak of the coronavirus in the community was widespread, and on 26th of March, Bnei Brak was ranked second in the nation in the number of confirmed cases, and of course, uh, we will deal with it later. So when everyone understood that we have reached a state of emergency, they began to act and they began to act fast. The health ministry began aggressively publicizing through the, through the communication mediums of the Haredi sectors, a formal appeals by doctors and rabbis to obey the guidelines. Even the, the, the spiritual leaders became, uh, began taking a clear stand. Let's take uh, uh, the leading uh, Haredi rabbi Kanievsky, a sign of a guideline even, that were even stricter than those of the health ministry. So we are in April, the message has come through the Haredi public and aside from a handful of extremists, uh, it's evident that the community is obeying the directives, understanding the gravity of the situation and of course, carefully observing the rules. But the question that minutes. we ask ourselves, the, the question that we ask ourselves is, is why did we lose the two weeks between when restrictions were imposed and when the community internalized it? So that is the main question. And we go back again to understanding the unique characteristics. So that's what happened in a nutshell, but where does it leave us? The current crisis has, on the one hand, created a state of emergency, required immediate intervention. And on the other hand, of course, it creates significant opportunities for change, which could and should start happening now. Um, we in the Hard Institute has laid four key intervention areas uh, along with opportunities. The first is economic development. The second and third is strengthening of local government and social society organization. We'll focus on it uh, in our presentation. Of course, uh, digitization. Um, you'll see along the presentation, we'll, we'll touch uh, uh, briefly on the, the issue of digitization, but in the essence, of course, we are talking about a dramatic uptick in internet use, and we see it as a game changer. Uh, no doubt. So I want to summarize, there is a need for fundamental and factual intervention tailored to the needs of, uh, as you understand, it needs to be tailored to the needs and customs of the Haredi sector. Any attempt to manage the situation ordinary times, and especially in times of crisis, without taking into account, uh, could lead to severe consequences of both communal, but not only, but only in also, sorry, in, in national scale. So that's the 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 characteristic, that's the timeline. And now I'm pleased to turn the floor over to my colleagues. Thank you, Roy. Um, thank you, Roy, for that overview. It is my pleasure to introduce Nitsa kalinar Kassir. Nitsa is the Vice Chairman of the Haredi Institute for Public Affairs. She's former head of the Labor Market and Social Policy Divisions of Bank of Israel's Research Department. In the next 10 minutes, Nitsa will focus on the economic development challenges of the COVID-19 crisis pose for Haredim and opportunities of approach regarding the job market. Thank you, Nitsa. Thank you. 
as we assess the economic situation of Israel's Haredi society in the wake of Corona, we can point to both challenges and opportunities. Throughout this presentation, it will be helpful to compare this economic crisis to previous crises affecting the Israeli economy. Namely, the crisis of the early 2000s, which included the dot-com bust and intifada. Let's first zoom in on the challenges. To begin, let's examine the general unemployment figures. We have never before encountered such a high rate of unemployment in Israel. We haven't even reached half this rate in other crises. When we look at populations that were hurt most during past crises, we see that it's the weaker populations. In the crisis of 2000s, the unemployment rate among the poorly educated reached double the unemployment rate among the highly educated. And when we emerge from a crisis, it takes longer for the weak population to get back to normal. If you look at the graph, note that it took an average of eight years for the poorly educated to recover employment versus only an average of three years for the highly educated. Haredim are one of the weakest populations in terms of employment. Even though Haredi men generally study for many years, their studies often don't correspond to the job market. Additionally, the Haredi sector is extra vulnerable as the poverty rate among Haredim is six times that among Israel's non-Haredi Jewish citizens. This is owed to large households and weak participation in the job market. We must consider the following factors. One, this population has a low rate of employment and those who are employed are likely to work part-time, to work in small independent businesses or in temporary unskilled jobs. Two, Haredi employment is concentrated in specific professions, some of which were hurt by the crisis, at least in the short term. Three, Haredi salaries are much lower than that of the general public. Let's look at the scope of economic difficulties now facing the Haredi sector. One, Haredim generally have less savings. Two, government payment transfers are likely to be cut. Three, the community will be less able to look after its own. Four, regular funding from Jewish communities abroad will likely be minimized. Communal organizations, yeshivot, and families will suffer. Five, many parents will be unable to pay tuition due to financial difficulty. This will affect the livelihood of educators in the Haredi educational system, which, as I mentioned before, is subsidized by parents. Now, to understand the upcoming challenges a bit better, let's look at the government policy before the crisis. Past policy focused on employment of diverse populations, and lately on improving the quality of employment. However, post-corona, there will likely be less focus on diverse populations than before, since all population have been affected by the crisis. The government will need to focus on getting people back to work and a lot of the government budget will be directed to healthcare, business relief, etc. If we imagine the job market after the crisis, we can predict some changes to come. We can expect an increase in remote work, the job market, 
employers and employees will need to adapt to this reality. Until now, most Haverim, Haredim have not had the ability to work from home. Only 58% of Haredim report owning a home computer, and only 31% have internet access. But as I like to say, in every bad situation, there is a bit of good. So let's step back and look at the opportunities. The Haredi sector, poverty is mostly by choice. However, as their financial situation worsened in this crisis, more and more Haredim might seek employment. As you can see, after the 2000 crisis, there was an increase in employment for both Haredi men and women. Haredi men began to enter the job market and the rate of Haredi women entering the job market was accelerated. Today, the employment rates of Haredi women are higher than the average of women in the OECD by 11 points. We also saw a change in the diversity and quality of women's professions and in their educational options within communal training seminaries. Today, the amount of Haredi women employed in education is down to 40% compared to 60% the early 2000s. Additionally, in 2003, Haredi women were barely represented in the high-tech sector. Today, the presentation of Haredi women in the sector is almost in par with non-Haredi Jewish women. We now see an opportunity to increase digital orientation, professional training opportunities, and remote working possibility in the Haredi sector in accordance with its unique lifestyle. This was of course necessary before Corona, but the need is more glaring now. While Haredi households still report less access to the internet in relation to the general public, 78% report using the internet more due to Corona. Many report that they will continue to use the internet once this crisis is over. So, to summarize, although there are many challenges facing the Haredi sector in the post-corona era, there are new opportunities to be encouraged, especially by third sector efforts. One, Haredi households, leadership, and institutions are more open te to technology than before. Two, online training and working from home will become more acceptable in the future job market. This trend will allow greater educational and employment opportunities for Haredim, many of whom prefer not to study or work in mixed gender environments. Three, there is a communal motivation to improve human capital through higher level training courses in order to be, to be less in danger of unemployment and more relevant to the future job market. Four, there is a future, a further opportunity to professionalize small businesses owners and freelancers so they are better prepared for extreme situations. I am always glad to end on an optimistic note. Identifying the opportunities in this crisis can help point us to a better future for the Haredi economy and indeed for Israel as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nitza. Thank you for giving us this economic development overview of Haredi society. And I think that is a perfect segue to talk about future directions for strategic interventions. In 2018, at the request 
request of the president's office, Ruben Rivlin, Jewish Funders Network convened 13 JFN member organizations chaired by Daniel Goldman and Michal Herzog of the Wall Foundation to form the Coalition for Haredi Employment with the purpose of advancing the quality of Haredi employment in Israel. Chaviva Eisler, who was chosen to lead the coalition, will demonstrate in the next 10 minutes practical interventions that have been tried and tested by funders with the opportunity to implement the lessons learned in the Haredi community as we emerge from this crisis. Chaviva, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, and I want to thank you, Nitsa. I think that was a uh, tremendous presentation and also Roe's presentation to help us better understand where the future directions are, where the opportunities are. I just want to take a minute and um, explain the uh, development of the coalition. The coalition, I feel very at home in this forum because the coalition is a funder-driven um, coalition. We're, um, it was started by the funders, as Sharon said, together with JFN, together with the president's office, and we want to bring about another breakthrough. Nitsa talked about the first breakthrough, but even pre-corona, given the de demographics, it was clear um, that the Haredi population had to uh, contribute to the Israeli economy. The situation was unsustainable. unsustainable. And um, we put together a partnership of major philanthropy of Haredi field and community op um, organizations and many other institutional players and also key stakeholders of the Haredi community. Um, our idea and the idea is to use research as um, to drive our approach through research uh, the Sheldor, um, Sheldor Consulting Company actually did extensive research to identify the uh, six areas where we would um, focus our efforts. And the idea is to collectively move the needle. Um, it's a very complex problem. I think that both for we and Nitsa talked about the many different elements that are involved in helping um, creating access quality employment. A collective approach is needed because there's not one silver bullet. Um, there are many different stakeholders. We're talking about the community. We're talking about the employers. We're talking about the government. There's a clear link between quality and quantity of employment, if you're talking about the Haredi community. In many other peripheral or, um, communities, when you talk about promoting employment, there's a link between education and employment. That link is not clear when you're talking about the Haredi community. The primacy of Torah learning and the ability of Haredi communities or Haredi employers, employees, Sorry, I'm going to start again. The unique challenges of the Haredi community are linked to both the quality of employment and the quantity of employment. And that is due to the alternative income sources that um, the Haredi community has. Poverty is not something that motivates to employment. Living modestly is a value in the Haredi community. And therefore, what other people may see as a motivator to employment doesn't work with the Haredi community. And when the government policy focused on helping Haredi access the uh, workforce, they were, because of their low levels of education, because of the low human capital, they weren't able to access high quality jobs and that decreased the motivation to work. The Sheldor research that is the uh, basis of the coalition work has identified two major strategies um, to help promote quality employment. One is workers for jobs and not, work, not jobs for workers. Up until, I would say two years ago, anybody working in the area of employment for any marginalized population talked about soft skills and employability. 
the idea was that if we enhanced human capital, these same future employees would know how to look for jobs. But there was no clear direction of where the jobs are. Sheldor actually said, changed the paradigm, and they said, look for the jobs. There are, at any given time, there are 30,000 high quality jobs in the Israeli economy. Help Haredim, and they identified 78,000 Haredim who are interested in accessing the labor market. They said, help them find appropriate employment by starting with employers and then moving on to the jobs. That's one track that we're looking at. We're looking at the current working age population. And the other track that we're looking at is preparing the next generation for quality employment. Today, Haredim are employed at the lowest level, the entry level jobs. There's a growing number of employees who are working at mid-level jobs, but very, very few are accessing the higher tier. It's if we want to create legitimacy for employment within the Haredi community, we have to create a normative employment curve. And to do that, we have to prepare the next generation for employment. And this is in line with the norms and accepted values within the Haredi community. It means increasing access to um, STEM education, and it can be done if it's done appropriately. I think that the coronavirus and the, that we're experiencing now has highlighted several opportunities. The Sheldor research highlighted vocational training as the main uh, mechanism for helping the Haredi community access high, val high value employment. But vocational training isn't standalone. Vocational training has to start with employers. Our research identified um, some of the main problems with vocational training that made it very unpopular within the community. We've identified a back-to-back -back approach where training starts with the employers. Employers are involved in the content and hands-on learning. We're working with blue-collar employers, we're working with the medical professions, we're working with the high-tech professions to be able to help them create um, training programs that will be accessible to the community. I think that the government stimulus package that has allocated 200 million shekel to training, to vocational training, is actually the perfect opportunity to um, help Haredi retrain and diversify the areas that they're working in and moving from low level training, low level professions and uh, create career ladders. I think that employers are one of the um, most important links. And I also want to talk about financial incentives. The government has put together a uh, multifaceted uh, multifaceted stimulus package that includes living stipends. Just prior to the onset of the crisis, we had worked again with the Sheldor um, Institute to create many, many types of conditional loans and financial tools that would serve as a um, security net because Haredim can't train and support their families at the same time. So we're working on creating, together with the government, um, major packages um, that will tie together the work of the employers, the vocational training, and conditional loans. And I think that the philanthropy has a major role to play here. Where we talked about distrust of the government um, and where the Haredi community is suspicious of the government, philanthropy can breathe the bridgehead. I'm talking to a community of funders. The, the initiatives that we're developing at the coalition right now, they were true before the crisis and they were even more true after the, after the crisis. I think they've, um, they have more urgency and I think that they will serve not only the Haredi community, but a lot of, of the other marginalized populations. 
I want to take one more minute or two more minutes in the time that's allotted to me to talk about remote working and remote. You have work. one and a half, Aviva. One and a half. Thanks, Shira. Okay. Remote working and remote learning are probably the greatest opportunities. Vocational training can be accessed from the comfort of your home. You don't have to um, you don't have to leave the house to be able to work. You can do it to learn. You can do it at your convenience. Um, your neighbors don't have to know what's happening. Um, and remote working actually expands the expands the employment opportunities. Well, this is hard doing on Zoom. Expands all the employment opportunities. You can work. You can live in the neighborhood and work for a company in Carmel. You can continue upskilling as you're working. And I just want to go in the minute I have left, I just want to talk about the role of local government. The first breakthrough was created by local government. It was created by a local municipality together with philanthropy. The second breakthrough of Haredi employment is also fueled by local government. They are the legitimate mouthpiece of the Haredi community, both political, rabbinical, and social. They were identified as the leaders of the community, and I think they have a major role in implementing new cutting-edge solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Habiba, for that okay. overview and also for giving us an insight into what initiatives funders can actually get involved with, um, both through vocational training and digitization. And I think ending on the municipalities is a perfect segue to introduce Mr. Itzhak Pindrus. And Itzhak is a senior fellow and managing director of the Haredi Institute for Public Affairs. He's the former mayor of Beitar Elite and deputy, former deputy mayor of Jerusalem. He'll take us through the role of the Haredi municipalities um, during this time. Itzhak, the Zoom is yours. I would like to continue really with the, what the Chaviva started and uh, what he started before. Uh, the, in generally, I could say, the Haredi uh, uh, public acts different than uh, the regular public. And what he started with Purim as an example, uh, that every Purim, uh, a regular Haredi person met probably, if you uh, add them all together, a couple thousand people, a regular uh, Purim meal could be a meeting because the doubling and everyone walked in with a hundred people, so he met a couple thousand people. And the same idea is a, a regular uh, shul minion. So you have uh, five rooms and each room has 30 people and you go around between the rooms. So it's not meeting 30 or 15 people, even the government says 19 people, you're meeting a couple hundred people every morning. I mean, the, the act is different. Uh, I, I, I'll bring a small example. In, 1990, when I came to Beitar Yili. So there was a big problem every Friday in water because no one ever thought when they did the plumbing and they did the water system over there that a Friday afternoon in an Orthodox uh, home, you use uh, five or 10 times as much water you use a whole week. And that gave uh, problems in the plumbing. So the, the, the main, I would say the main uh, problem and issue that we're facing is I would call it translating and I'm using it in a different way than Matt, I used it in the neighbor, translating between Yiddish and Hebrew. I'm mean, translating a, a style of life, a way of life, in the, uh, to a, a language that uh, people that do planning or do any uh, public affairs or anything, that they know how to translate the, the, the regular culture of life. The government really has no idea, no idea or no tools to get to uh, the uh, regular style of life and to understand not only what the needs are or how, how things happen, okay? If uh, anyone would think that it's a, a, a Purim in the Haredi community is a soccer game and I'm bringing the Corona as an example, uh, they would act different. They would say, you know, soccer game, everybody knew after the big soccer game in Europe that had spread the disease. Everybody would say, you know, Purim is our next soccer game. And, for an example, Israel, before Pesach, everybody knew that Pesach people get together with older people. So Israel went for two weeks, was getting ready for the night of the Seder. No one even thought that was going to be a problem. And I'll bring another example. The uh, ways that the, the public knew what to do and what not to do 
was uh, through uh, Netanyahu getting on television and telling people not to shake hands and not to hug. I think I was one of the only people in my community that asked people not to hug me on Purim, which is something very natural that the people do at Purim, of course, when they're drunk. And after they drink a couple of uh, bottles of, uh, of the schnapps, and that was like, it was weird. Like, why are you shaking hands? And people looked at me like I fell off the roof. Why aren't you doing it? And people that saw TV, you saw that they out getting at television and saying to everybody, stop shaking hands. No, but in my community, nobody knew what, what, what it's all about. So I think the corona is, is an opportunity to see, uh, everybody could see the differences between, like I said before, between Yiddish and people. Okay, after we see what the problem is, I think the, the, the closest uh, group that could translate, okay, is the local municipalities. In the last 20 years, uh, it was developed in Israel 25 years, it started about 25 years in the middle of the 90s, was the local municipalities. Now, the local municipalities faced that challenge 25 years ago, 20 years ago. I don't know if you all remember, Member of Nebrak went through a, a crisis that uh, the same Nebrak went through now. Uh, that the, the municipality was uh, uh, was uh, by the government. They closed it down. They brought people from outside to run the city because they could run it. But uh, even when I'm looking at myself in Beitar, we faced that challenge translating between regulations, uh, regular public affairs, into Yiddish, into the. Haredi society into the Haredi style of life. How do you translate one to each other? How do you translate these things? And those were the challenges that the Haredi uh, municipalities have been facing for the last 25 years. So if I'm looking at a group that that's the closest to their translation is, uh, like I said before, is the local municipalities, the local governments. They, they could uh, do it. They know the style of life. They know the language of the government. And they could be in the middle they know how to deal with it, and they should be the people in the middle. What I think is, and I want to make a point that I think they need a lot of help, okay? And a lot of investment to, uh, to train them to do it. And we saw it even now. I mean, there was some problems before we're talking about the, the government involving them and the decisions of the government involving them. But I think there is a specific need to train them to speak. They shouldn't change from one to each other, okay? When a person comes in and wants to be very professional, so he starts speaking only Hebrew. And if he starts speaking any Hebrew, he's basically not doing his real job. And you could see differences between municipalities. The municipalities that speak better Yiddish, the municipalities that speak better Hebrew. And I think the challenge is to get them to really translate from Hebrew to Yiddish. And that has to be, and from Yiddish to Hebrew, they have to translate their their plans, how to do it correct and how to do it right in the culture of the people they're serving. They're serving and they have to know how to do it in a proper and a proper way and to do it right and correct. So I think that's that's the main challenge now. I think we could use the corona for it. We could use the, uh, the, the crisis of the corona could be used to train the municipalities at one time. And, and the second uh, uh, thing is the government. Again, the ones that speak Hebrew, to understand that challenge and to understand that they need someone to translate. They need someone to be part of the decision makers. They need them when the decision is making. When you're sitting and talking in a, and consulting, what do we do now that the corona is coming to Israel? And knowing that what did in Spain and in Italy or wherever was a big soccer game. So what's the similar Yiddish soccer game over here? Okay, and if you're talking about a, a, a challenge of the, of the Financially, you're talking about a financial crisis. What does that mean with the Haredi community? How are they going to act? Where is it going to put them? What are they going to do different? How are they going to do it? If you want to get schools back, how do you do it? How do you do it? And like I'm saying again, the corona is only an example. Uh, the, uh, the government has to involve them more, has to put them more into the picture. And I believe you'll see right after it, when no one's going to speak, that if the government would put uh, uh, Nebrak beforehand, and Jerusalem, we didn't even hear about it so much, like they but just to, for the numbers, Jerusalem was a higher a number of people that got sick in, in, in the, the corona now, it was the highest number. 
and the highest number was more in the Haredi community. So if I take the Haredi community, I move the Arab community aside, I move the general community aside, and I leave the Haredi community, Jerusalem was a bigger crisis. People didn't hear about it so much because the municipality took ownership at a pretty early stage and was running it, and the mayor was pretty strong because, uh, uh, again, he's the mayor of Jerusalem, so he's uh, more involved in generally, but still, it needs to be part of a, 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 of a basic policy that when you want to deal with the Haredi community, which we saw before, and uh, what Pizza said, we're talking about a very large community, getting the municipalities involved in the two ways. First of all, when you make the decisions, and second of all, uh, when, uh, when you make the decisions, and second of all, when you want to deliver those decisions and you want to deliver it and get it happen, you have to take municipalities that are there every day. They know who they're serving, they know how to serve them, and they know where the language is. And I think that our challenge today is, the third thing, is to get them more, uh, to be a lot more, uh, do it a lot better, and, be uh, really the translation and not trying to do one of the two. Thank you, Yitzhak. Thank you for that. And I think this is a perfect opportunity to take a deep dive into Bnei Brak. As IDF Brigadier General Onen Manelis, former IDF spokesperson, will walk us through a test case study of one, as one of the heads of the Bnei Brak Emergency Task Force team during COVID-19. And um, Renan will give us an opportunity to kind of see what was going and to learn what are the lessons that we can learn from this. And Wanem, the Zoom is yours for the next 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to speak here and to hear for all the uh, presentation before. Uh, I have only 10 minutes to speak about one of the most interesting months that I was in my, uh, in my, in my life. Maybe my, one in my, my oh, very interesting positions. And I, after 24 years in the Israeli army, I was intelligence officer in all the fronts. I uh, was executive assistant for the chief of general staff, General Eisenkot, uh, and the former IDF spokesperson for two and a half years. And I think this month in Nebrak was one of the most interesting lessons that, that I have. So I will try to do it in nine and a half minutes, but if someone will want more deep uh, presentation, so it in another time. I born and, and raised for 19 years in, Jer in Bet Shemesh. So I think before it became a Haredic city. Uh, so maybe this is my part of uh, uh, beginning of the connection from the uh, Haredic cities. Um, and I want to start maybe with one of the points that Roy said in his uh, short presentation about the dictionary that the soldiers from the parachute brigade uh, prepared when they came to Nebrak. And it was a big story in the Israeli press that the parachutes come to Bnei Brak, they are our best brigade and they are our best soldiers and they prepare a dictionary from Hebrew to, Eng to uh, Yiddish with the uh, English letters. And the only thing is that when, when they come, I asked them why you, you came with, to Bnei Brak with the Yiddish dictionary. They told me because we want to speak with the population. I told them nobody in, in Bnei Brak need to speak uh, the Yiddish, they always speak Hebrew. Uh, it's not Mea Sha'arim. They know uh, Yiddish, but they can speak Hebrew. So this is the, a small uh, anecdote about the way the Israeli society looking on the Haredim as a, a com one complex and not as a very different parts and uh, different interests. So um, I have the opportunity to, to come to Bnei Brak in the April 1st, as part of the Bnei Brak Task Force, uh, the mayor, uh, Rabbi Avram Rubinstein, asked for Major General Numa uh, to come and to, be, to build a task force in, in Bnei Brak. And when I come, maybe before I will speak about what we did in, in, in the, um, uh, during the, the mission, maybe a, a little bit about Bnei Brak. Bnei Brak is a very small city. It's seven kilo square kilometers, more than 200,000 people living in this small uh, city. She's, it, this is a very poor city. It's in the second um, uh, part from the, from, uh, in, of the, uh, in Israel. Uh, most of the population are very young. 
uh, the, we're speaking about families uh, that living in 45,000 uh, homes. It's something like five people uh, average in each of the, of the apartments and in 4,000 buildings. It's very old buildings, very old city, a lot of people, and I, th I think you can say very poor uh, city. Uh, and in this situation, we are coming in, in the situation, we have hundreds on the 1st of April, hundreds of uh, coronavirus uh, sick in, in Bnei Brak, and the number is doubled every day, 400, 800, 1,000, 1,200 uh, uh, in, the, in, in April 7th, we already have more than 2,000 people. It's the biggest number in all Israel, more than Jerusalem, more than other, other cities. And this is the situation when we come to, we come to Bnei Brak. And uh, what we understand is that the situation in Bnei Brak is very unique and unique only, not only because the coronavirus, it's unique because the coronavirus met a very unique community. Uh, if you speak about people in Tel Aviv, so uh, uh, you hear the example about the uh, prime minister's speech, how you need to, what you can do and what you cannot do, they didn't hear about it. But another thing, you, you, tell, you tell the people that if you're sick, you need to stand only in one room and to use your own toilet. They don't have their own toilet and they, are, they don't have their own room. So if you ask them to do that, they, they cannot understand you because in the same room, there are two or three brothers. And if the mother is sick, so who will prepare the food for all the family? And when you stop the yeshivas, so it's not only for your small family, all the brothers come back home. They all eat in other place before the corona. Today, you need to give food for 12, 13 people, not only for four or five. Uh, and in this situation, we're coming in, it's Pesach Eve. It's two or three days before Pesach. Pesach, as you know, is one of the most Jewish religious uh, 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 holidays, we have a lot of preparation before uh, to looking for chametz, to uh, the brennit, to build, uh, to boil the, the dishes, all this going to change. And, and you, you understand that one of the, you, one of the problem you have is to speak with the society about the coronavirus. The second one is to take out the people that they are sick, but the third, it's to give them the answers, how you going to do your uh, uh, are we going to behave in these two weeks of Pesach? Um, so we understand we have uh, a lot of problems. One, the people, we have very big number of people sick, but they don't want to leave their families. Mother don't want to leave her family uh, during the coronavirus because she, nobody else can, can give them the food. Second, we, don't, we cannot use the same uh, orders like in the regular um, uh, population because it will not work in the neighbor. Third, you cannot use the same methods of uh, giving the orders because they don't use internet in the same numbers. They don't see the prime minister's speeches. They don't, they don't have computers in their homes. The, the, the fourth, we need to find a way to understand what we know about this city and how we can build this knowledge. And here I will try uh, to speak with you a little bit about uh, six or seven points uh, that can show you what we what we did and how we you, maybe we can use it on on on, um, on the future. But I want I want to start with this picture. This is me and the team of Mayor Rubenstein. Uh, I think for me this is all the story. In the end, everything is people. Everything is the connection between different people. I didn't know nobody in this picture before I came to Bnei Brak. I worked with them for a month. I think they are my brothers today. I think that the, the, the first thing that we can change is the, the understanding of these different tribes, if we call it like the president, different parts of Israel about uh, those both communication, the, the, the people that the Haredi and the not Haredi uh, in Israel. And, and for me, 
after this month, the understanding that we are one family. I, I left my family, I, I came as a volunteer, Ronnie Numa came as a volunteer for one month. Uh, you can understand what my wife thought about going to Bnebrak and not stay at home uh, during the coronavirus uh, peak in Israel. So I think this is all the story. If we need to do something, it's to have better connection, better understanding, and better meetings between different people. Uh, they're all wonderful people, but we don't know them before. And I, I was in the neighborhood, I have soldiers from neighborhoods, I have officers of neighborhoods, but they still, for me, it's unique uh, uh, meetings with those people. And it's not only the team of the mayor, it's the leaders, it's the hotters, it's the rabbis, it's the, the people in the street. This is the first thing. The second thing- Thank you, and then is that another minute and a half? Oh. Okay, so we didn't hear nothing about what happened in Nebrak, but I will try to do it uh, faster. The how you build operation room. Uh, we spoke about the, 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 the part of the municipality uh, in the Haredi Street, but it's not on the Haredi Street. We, this part, kind of operation room we didn't have, in, we don't have in, in, I think, most of the municipality in Israel. When you put together people that know to do logistic, uh, to crisis management, uh, a communication uh, together, we, we build it together in a uh, neighborhood. This is the, the first uh, part. The second part is to give answers to the people. We don't use internet. You need to give them the call center. How you build the call center? Here we use soldiers, uh, but it can be not only soldiers. How you, how you give them the answers to their uh, needs? The, the digital. I think it's, it's can, we can speak about smart cities not only the Haredi Street, but here in the Haredi Street, I think it, it's very important because of the fact that they, they don't have, all of them don't have internet. They don't have, everyone have not access to the internet. The way the city will build, the understanding about the people that live there, how they, where they live, their names, their, how we can get them, and how we can speak with them. But it's not only the, those digital uh, maps. It's my understanding of the, 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 uh, how they live as a, as a building. I call it smart buildings. We used uh, connectors in each of the building in Nebrak. People, that give, we give them a phone and we called us. But if I can think about the vision, you can do a smart building. You can put in every building a, 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 a computer, that a kosher one that give you the, the orders that you can, you can use them as a part uh, of your uh, uh, managing the crisis and managing the, the city. The volunteers and, and the, it's the car organizations, here it's, we built together the, this operation room with the people from the city and uh, here it's MADA, but it can be, it can be Zaka and Yehuda Tzala and other organization. I think that in coronavirus, we understand that Zaka is more than Golani Brigade. And it's not something that every officer can say. In this coronavirus, to be in Zaka, to be in Yehuda Tzala, no, no, it's a lot of organization, okay? And speak only about some of them, but all of those organization. They have very important rule in the streets. And maybe it's a part of the answer of how we do service for all. If you're speaking about service for all, maybe service in this organization is part of the answer uh, 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 later. And uh, in my last uh, point, it's how we connect to those people. I used as the IDF, office, IDF uh, spokesperson all the very technological way to speak with the people in Israel. Here in Bnei Brak, I use Pashkavils and newspapers, and uh, I can hear you. Uh, and ram calls in the streets. I think we have a big opportunity to, to use this situation to, to take them to um, maybe more, more internet, new wave of communication, new way of getting the message uh, for sure in a large time, but not only uh, in, 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 in a large time. But in my, in my last point, it's this picture. In the end, in the same room, it's the mayor and the major general retired Numa together. They understand they, they only bo can both together can give the answer for a city like Nebrak. 
when I came to Bnei Brak, people said, who is this non-religious guy that come here and want to try to speak with us about Corona? I, 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 the only one can do it because they can connect between the uh, ministers in, in, in Tel Aviv or in Jerusalem and the people in Bnei Brak. I don't do it by myself. I must to have help from Haredi uh, people. But in the end, this, this fact that we together me and them do it, do it together, that Roni Numa and, and Rabbi Rubinstein do it together, that when I come to Rabbi Kanievsky or to other rabbi in, in Zilberstein or others in the city, and we speak together and they understand that the, we are the crisis management professionals. So I think it's beginning of a change and maybe the, this short visit in the neighborhood and this short presentation, it's beginning of something else. I think we have a lot of things to do uh, we can do in the future. But if we will not do it now, I'm afraid that in month, two months, most of the society in Israel will forget about this crisis with the Haredi. So and I think- that. Thank you so much. Thank you. I know that, um, first of all, thank you for giving us an in-depth look and for volunteering. I know it's hard to tell an IDF spokesperson to limit to 10 minutes. So I gave you a little bit more leeway. Um, we really appreciate that overview. And we'll have questions, I'm sure, that we'll save for the Q&A. Um, you talked a lot about um, civil society organizations and Gunei Zedaka, and I, we talked, you know, the coronavirus mentioned a lot of things about Rifua, but I promise you that we'll have both Rifua and Simcha. And there's no one more Samer than Rabbi Israel Chishinsky. Um, Israel joined JFN recently, and he thought he was the only Haredi member. Little did he know that within a few months, he would be on a call with so many funders from all over the world, concerned to learn and support Israel Haredi society. Israel is the founder and chair of Refua Simcha, which is a civil society organization that has over 8,000 8, volunteers all over the country and some across the world as well. In the next 10 minutes, Mary Quinn, the CEO of Refua Simcha, will give us insight into the operation of this organization during the time of the crisis. Mayor, thank you. Shalom everyone from Jerusalem. My name is Mayor Quinn. I'm the CEO of Refua Simcha. I'm representing also our founder and chairman, Rabbi Isai Chishinsky, who is also a valuable member of JNF. I want to say a few words about civil society support organization during emergencies. Refua Simcha is active in many different avenues for the patients and the families. Backed by an army of almost 9,000 volunteers throughout Israel, it is almost impossible to find a location without a Fuaba Simcha representative. Therefore, when the Corona crisis began, we already had the necessary network to immediately, to immediately respond to the demands created by this pandemic. Hundreds of thousands of people suddenly found themselves without medications and basic food. Our volunteers answered to over 26,000 help requests coming from public or private sources. It is statistically proven that the Haredi community is highly involved in many different voluntary programs. That's why I think that all the Haredi professional organizations and volunteers must be involved in every future crisis management. The involved should be expressed in four main circles. A, decision making. Every decision must be calculating the fact that the Haredi community has their own needs and beliefs. For example, a Haredi woman will ask where I will light Shabbat candle before she will, she will be interested in the quality of the place where she is about to be staying. 
B. The Haredi community have a very specific language. An official government representative must explain the situation to the chief rabbis and they will be published to the community in a Haredi language, prohibited or allowed. C. There are many professional Haredi organizations that have all the abilities to handle most situations. First aid, transporting sick people, sick people medications, and mental care. D. Rehabilitation. In order to heal someone, you need to really understand what he has been through. A typical Haredi would prefer not to be treated in a way that contradicts his religious beliefs. That's why I think the Haredi organizations must be a part of each of these four cycles. Have a good day and best of health to you all. Good night from Yerushalayim. Thank you so much, Mayor, and thank you, Israel. Um, I think that there's one little piece of information that I'd like to share with the group is that you've been working around the clock with so many um, volunteers, but you're also doing the simcha that you, um, I think you had two or three um, bar mitzvahs for kids and families that were in, um, that were um, suffering from Corona, and you made it happen behind the scenes from the hotels, bringing the food, bringing the families together, um, and keeping, of course, in, in line with the guidelines. So you really do bring the flying simcha, and we really, really appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you very much. You're all invited to Yerushalayim to see and hear all of these beautiful things that we do. Shani Abrim v'niske. Amen. Um, so we're nearing the end of, the, of the, this conversation, and to help us process and crystallize all of the information we heard, and to kick off the philanthropic discussion, I would like to invite Ellie to lead us in the thunder portion of the conversation. Following Ellie's remarks, we will open up the Zoom for Q&A. You're welcome to, again, um, put, a, put a question in the chat box, or if you would like to raise your hand, wave, we'll call on you. Um, so Ellie, the floor is yours. Please unmute yourself. Hi, thank you again. Um, I must admit that even though that I was uh, very much involved in the preparation, I was so impressed with the diversity of the voices that we were able to see. But I think that the general, and this is what I would like to conclude, the general message was, and this is the message that we as a foundation who are focusing and trying to convince the rest of our partners, whether it's the uh, philanthropy partners, government, and others, there is such a huge potential by collaborating with the Haredi society. I think that the, the approach of trying to solve Haredi problems instead of trying to build a real partnership, of working together, taking the advantage of the added value of the society, as Ronen emphasized so nicely with his, from his experience, I think that this is the main lesson that I would like to take from this uh, uh, event. I hope that if that lesson will, will take with us, uh, I think it, it will change the approach of all of us about what kind of intervention is much is more effective. And I think that it's about time to try to discover what is really the potential that exists in the human capital, the community models in the Haredi society, I would like just to, to for, this, for me, this is the main lesson. I, I would like just to conclude what I think people repeat the same ideas. And if you ask me, Sharon, to share what is the main direction that we see as the relevant intervention in the future. So from my perspective, there is no question, the one of the big challenges. Ronen spoke about the great people he met in Venebra. I want to speak about, I know those people. I think one of the challenges is how we can make those people, besides being great and, 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 and talented people, to be more professionals. So I'm, I'm here raising a call of creating a, 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 one of the projects that the, our foundation is supporting was the Maoz a, a, a program. Maoz is a training program for leadership. I think that there is a huge opportunity and a huge need to create 
continue to create different kinds of training programs to train the civil society and the municipal society uh, to give them tools that some of them are lacking because they are missing some of the experience that the regular Israeli people pass through the army and other opportunities. So that's A, professional uh, leadership. Second one, which Ronen spoke about, that Yitzhak spoke and Roi mentioned, is understanding the, 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 the huge potential of creating a working model with the Haredi municipality. It's crucial. The, the Haredi municipalities, this is really the, the best tool to A, to understand the needs, but also to the implementation and the delivery. I think that I spoke in the past with the home front, and I think one of the challenges that the Institute is working now is to create such a paper about how in the future that we, we, we won't face it, but, but to be ready to another crisis, whether it's an earthquake or a war, how we can work in a much more systematic way and creating an, 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 an Hamal, an, an, an emergency uh, uh, task force to work with uh, the municipalities with their capacity and knowledge and, 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 and uh, uh, access to the society. We mentioned the social, the, the, the civic society. There is a huge potential. Uh, Mayor spoke about it and Ronen mentioned it and, and some others. I think one of the mistakes that we saw, it's great to bring commando people to Bnei with the Yiddish dictionary, but the, we're talking about huge organizations with thousands of volunteers, Ichud Atzala, Zaka, Ezer Mitzion, Refua Vesimcha, they have huge operations. And instead of trying to bring commando people with dictionaries, if we will be able again to create a system, and that's require really a national effort. It's not just, uh, okay, who, who is ready to volunteer? How we can really bring an efficient and, and professional model to work together? So that's another challenge that we see from the Institute as a, as a potential. And for sure, we spoke about vocational training. Um, we spoke about digital access that we, I think that this is also an area that now we can take this as an opportunity. And again, to conclude, I think that Corona, what, the main lesson that we can take from the Corona is, A, you can't ignore uh, the Haredi society because that will turn to our faces and, and, and it will affect all of us, not just the Haredi society, but B, there is so much potential of working together and empowering the, the, the local uh, 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 authorities and the local organizations, which will enable us to create a better society and even a better integration between Haredim and the rest of the Israeli society. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Eli. So I just wanted to first thank again, Eli and your leadership and your partnership in making this happen. Thank you to the dedicated staff at the Haredi Institute for Public Affairs and for the wonderful speakers that we had here today. Thank you, Chaviva. Thank you, Israel, and thank you, Meir. Um, and the question right now, I assume that you're all asking is, where do we take this conversation? Well, this is up to you. We invite you to reach out to us at JFN. If you would like to participate in a funders think tank on this issue, if you would like to connect with other funders working in this field, please feel free to share with us what you're involved with, what's your response to this crisis. And of course, we're here to answer any further questions you may have. We've recorded this meeting and in the upcoming days, we will be able to share it on our website. So if you know people that were not able to join us, you're welcome to share that with them as well. And I'd like to end with really wishing all of us as we transition into this post-corona reality, I would like to wish us all a lot of health and to continue this conversation, to continue it with an open mind and to really become a bridge. I think that this is a beautiful demonstration within our funder community, the diversity that we have, the different voices and how we can collectively work together. If anyone has anything else, and we will bid you all good night. Laila tov, ve'toda rabah, ve'tibu'u al-atzmechem.